The last effect that I want to talk to you about is the solvent effect. Solvents play a, an important role in determining the preferred mode of reaction in these substitution elimination reactions. In most cases this year, we will not discuss solvents, although they are a very important component of organic chemistry reactions. The reason for this is that in general, the solvent effects become quite complicated and really it's much more of an advanced organic chemistry topic. So we're going to stick to the very basics and really only mention solvents when it's absolutely necessary. So if we look at the substrate and a nucleophile in these reactions, these species are going to be surrounded by solvent molecules in a process we call solvation. So for example, if we have a negatively charged nucleophile, it would have a positive counter ion, which I haven't drawn here, and it would probably exist in its pure state as an ionic salt, a solid, which has formed an ionic lattice. In order to get that nucleophile to be able to react with our substrate, we would need to dissolve that ionic salt. And in order to dissolve the ionic salt, we would probably have to use a polar solvent so that we get good attractive forces between the solvent and the ion, which will overcome the attractive forces among the counter ions in the ionic salt. So if the nucleophile, for example, has a negative charge and our polar solvent can be represented this way as sort of some abstract shape with a positive and negative end, that's why it's polar, we would see that when that negative ion breaks apart from the ionic lattice, the solvent would be attracted to it with its positive end and essentially many solvent molecules would surround that negative ion. This um, coating of solvent molecules is often called the solvation sphere. And although we've shown it just in two dimensions as a cross section, it really extends over the entire surface of the ionic particle. Now, just to give you an idea of this solvation sphere, the number of solvent molecules associated with an ion has been studied. Essentially, what researchers did was they dissolved different ions into water and then they measured the rate of diffusion. It turns out that there is a relatively straightforward equation that relates the rate of diffusion of a particle at a given temperature, at a given solvent, to its molar mass. So what they found was if they took a particle such as, for example, lithium positive ion, and they dissolved it in water, the lithium would be, uh, the lithium ion would be uh, surrounded by waters which would be uh, uh, attached or attracted by the negative end of the polar water molecule. By measuring then the effective mass based on the diffusion of the lithium ions, they discovered that there were approximately 25 mo water molecules surrounding and attracted to that lithium positive ion. That that whole structure then, which is not really a molecule, it's what we often call a supramolecular structure. It's a structure that has a relatively defined uh, arrangement of separated molecular particles. That structure then has a lithium plus in the center and 25 water molecules that essentially move as one unit. Now, the issue for us is that if we have a nucleophile which has a polar solvent surrounding it, 
solvating it in this way. Those polar solvent molecules are going to also contribute to steric hindrance. When the nucleophile tries to fit in and react into the space of a uh, substrate, it is going to have to try to force its way through these other solvent molecules that are crowding around it. This then creates kind of a dilemma. We need a polar solvent to dissolve the ionic nucleophile. However, highly polar solvents will also increase the rate of unimolecular reactions and they will increase the steric hindrance. There are two important types of highly polar solvents. The first is what is called a polar protic solvent. A polar protic solvent are essentially solvents that have hydrogen bond donors. They have a hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom like an oxygen or a nitrogen. That hydrogen has a significant amount of partial positive charge. And if we were put it into a hydrogen bond uh, with an, a hydrogen bond acceptor, it would form hydrogen bonding. We call them protic solvents because those positively charged hydrogens are essentially reminiscent of hydrogen plus, which is basically a proton. Examples of polar protic solvents include water and alcohols, which are two very common solvents that we use when we need to dissolve ionic substances. What we see is that the partially positive hydrogens on protic solvents will strongly interact with negatively charged nucleophiles and the lone pairs on those nucleophiles. This is going to cause strong solvation of the nucleophile and increase its steric hindrance. As a consequence, what we see is polar protic solvents disfavor SN2 reaction and they favor E2 reaction because as we mentioned when we have aggressive nucleophiles they will prefer to do bimolecular reaction. If SN2 is not available they will force E2 to occur instead. However scientists have found another type of polar solvent. These are called polar aprotic solvent aprotic meaning not having a protic hydrogen. In most cases they only have hydrogens on carbon atoms. Hydrogens on carbon atoms do not have a significant amount of positive charge and therefore they will not interact with a negatively charged nucleophile. The other characteristic of polar protic solvents is they have a polar bond of some kind. Very often an oxygen attached to an atom of lower electronegativity. The oxygen will have a negative or partial negative charge and there will be some other atom in the molecule close to the oxygen that has a positive charge. But the positively charged molecule will have other carbon groups on it that sterically hinder it. Therefore, the polar pro aprotic solvents will do strong solvation with cations and they will leave the negative anions unsolvated. We often call these naked anions or naked nucleophiles because they are not covered up with solvent. Some examples of polar aprotic solvents are shown here. One of the most common ones is dimethyl sulfoxide, which is abbreviated DMSO. And we are going to occasionally see this as uh, a solvent in reactions where we are really intending to do SN2 reaction. We also have dimethyl formamide, DMF. We have acetone. 
which has this structure. It's a ketone with two methyl groups. And then finally, we have this very complicated looking structure. It's essentially a phosphoric acid where we've replaced OHs with nitrogens, dimethyl amines, basically. So it's an amide of phosphoric acid. The name of this is hexamethyl, because there's six methyl groups, phosphoric, because it's based on phosphoric acid, triamide, because it's an amide, and there's three separate nitrogens forming three separate amides. This is abbreviated HMPA. HMPA is an amazing solvent. Unfortunately, it does have a very, very scary side effect. It is highly carcinogenic. And so um, we, for example, in our labs at OCC would never use HMPA. It requires very special conditions, very special handling, and an extreme amount of care to avoid chemical exposure. Polar aprotic solvents dissolve ionic salts by solvating the positive ion and ripping it out of the ionic structure and leaving the negatively charged anions uh, unsolvated, but forced to sort of float around without their positive charged uh, partners. Therefore, the nucleophiles are not hindered by the solvent and polar aprotic solvents dramatically favor SN2 reactions.